All right, again, since I'm, I'm, I'm expanding what was originally like a 75-minute lecture into four hours, a little bit of fluff, a little bit of extra stuff. So, so I'm not sure how long this one's going to take. That one was also entirely totally extra. Uh, today's topic is, well, uh, well, we're back from the break. The second half of today's topic is uh, Russell's paradox. And in general, this is like an introduction to logic not involved in geometry. Uh, we'll talk about Bertrand Russell uh, as well. So... Last time we mentioned, you know, there was a crisis in geometry because there was three consistent models. Uh, n taking a negation of one of the axioms didn't, produ didn't produce an inconsistency, but it produced a different worldview. And in fact, like you have some truth. Instead of, the, instead of truth being absolute and universal, it's now relative to the assumptions you make. So depending on if a, tri a triangle has interior angle sum of 180 degrees is conditional on the fact how many lines can you, parallel lines can you put through a point, turns out, right? The number that you're allowed to assume depends upon, will, will affect the number of, uh, the, the interior angle, some of the triangles you can produce. So truth appears relative uh, in that sense. Today we're going to talk about uh, what happens early 20th century, uh, late 19th century, starting with uh, uh, so the crisis in geometry really expanded to like a crisis in all of mathematics. So first attempt, and by, by logic, I don't just mean as a foundation of mathematics, but I mean as sort of like a logos, like part of the whole, um, you know, uh, decision make, uh, as a decision-making process. So the first thing, I just have to write it because it's what, what came first. Uh, Aristotle had a treatise called Organon. Uh, we don't really care about it beyond the fact that he was the first to do it, so the Greeks can say they did everything first. That's really the only reason I'm mentioning it. Um, Leibniz, you guys know, have you heard of Leibniz? Inventor calculus. Yes, he was the second and actually the better inventor of calculus. His calculus is much better than Newton's calculus, to be honest. Um, but he also did some other interesting things. He was also a historian. So, like, you couldn't just be a guy who did math all day. You had to have a real, you had to have a real job. Fermat was a judge. Aristotle was, and not, excuse me, Aristotle, definitely not Aristotle. Leibniz was a historian of some rich family. Like, he would go trace the lineage of whatever, whoever was a sponsor of the, of the you know, nobility and, and so on. And he had this, uh, he had the, that allowed him enough funding and free time to come up with some things. So he has this quote about how, you know, if you've ever done math, it seems kind of mechanical in some sense. You sit there, like, if, if it's something is true, like, for all x, f of x, then it seems like it's true, like, f of 3, right? It seems like, okay, all I've done here is really mechanically place x with 3, because 3 is in a, x could be 3. 3 is in a, uh, it seems kind of like I didn't really do any thinking involved here. It seems, uh, I want to stress the word here is mechanical. So Leibniz has this quote. Uh, he notes that ideas were compounded from some quote-unquote alphabet of human thought. And so he noted that like, the idea of deduction and of thinking appeared to be produced similar to the way you produce, you did arithmetic. So the quote is, it is obvious that if we could find characters or signs suited for expressing all our thoughts as clearly and exactly as arithmetic expresses numbers or geometry express, expresses lines, we could do in all matters insofar as they are subject to reasoning that, they, that all we can do in arithmetic and geometry. For all investigations which depend, depend on reasoning would be carried out by transposing these characters by a species of calculus. So he's sort of foreshadowing the fact that like, you can use symbolic manipulation, perhaps, to arrive at a deduction or a conclusion. So you have some statement. And in fact, the statement, the, the, the part where you given some facts, you produce a statement, a deduction, only occurs so far as, as much as it is a symbolic manipulation according to some well-defined rules. Now, that seems obvious to us because we're computer scientists. But it, uh, groundbreaking at the time, that fact that numbers, that you can use letters to represent numbers, it's fan, uh, you know, fantastic for him. Um, so there were some, several attempts at trying to do uh, this. There, there was one, uh, it was called Piano. Um, he was Italian, so it had to be sounded, sounded cool. It was called Formulario, Formulario Mathematico. It sounds kind of like a, I don't know, like a spell book or something, right? So he, he claimed that, you know, this was a 
this was all of mathematics. I had done all of mathematics in a book or whatever. And then he tried to teach it to a course. And he, and he has this quote, each professor will be able to adopt this formulario as a textbook, for it ought to contain all theorems and all methods. His teaching will be reduced to showing how to read the formulas and to, in, to indicating to the students the theorems that he wishes to explain the course. So it was just a collection of theorems in the, and the rules of deduction, which are themselves theorems. Excuse me. It was the axioms and the rules of deduction, which are the the rules of deduction are themselves axioms. You apply the axioms to the other axioms, basically. And he claimed that this book, finitely many axioms, finitely many rules of deduction, contained all the theorems. So if you ever wanted to prove a theorem, it was in the book because it contained the axioms in the way. It didn't tell you how to drive the theorem, but it had necessary tools to drive the theorem. And he, I think there was some story, like he tried to teach a math class, uh, repeatedly just doing symbolic placement of strings to uh, show proofs, and it was long and messy, and I think he was ousted. I think they, like made him fired or something. Um, uh, a more serious attempt was done by this guy named Fridge. Uh, probably the first analytic philosopher. And he had this book, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce it. It's not as cool as the other one. Um, the Griff Schrift. And this is self-described as a, a formal language modeled on that of arithmetic for pure thought. So he hoped to model all the way human deduction worked and all thinking worked through uh, a well-defined formal language that he came up with for uh, this book. And we don't actually use most of his notation anymore, but he did invent several uh, of the rules of deduction that we still use today. So among them, and we can credit these to him, is uh, as an axiom, if A is some statement, then A implies negation, negation of A. So a double negation, okay? Notice that it doesn't imply, he didn't say if and only if, I think. I hope that's not a typo in my thing. I think it goes one way. And then if you want to get the other way, you don't have to get that as an axiom. You can, you can do a double negation of a double negation or something, right? And then you get the other way for free. Um, so in some sense, and it, it, it's an on-purpose decision here that's being made that the axiom is minimal. And then anything else you can approve, you don't have to assume you, it's excluded from the axioms. Um, here's another obvious one. C equals D implies F of C equals F of D. Right? Doesn't, the rever reverse is certainly not true for all functions. But for all trunk functions, it's certainly, this, this forward direction certainly is true. C equals D implies F of C equals F of D. I mean, that's just it's classic. So C and D represent the same quantity and are then therefore interchangeable in all formulas, no matter what F is. Um, here's one. Maybe you guys have heard of it. A implies B. And A implies what? I don't know if they teach you this in 2050 or... 2160 or something. I, I have no idea if people know what this is called. What does this imply, by the way? Me? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's, do you know the name of this? Uh, it's it's going to be sounding weird in Greek and fancy, right? So Latin, actually. But I, I, I knew at some point. I, I'm trying to think. Probus, modus, ponens? Modus, ponens. I don't know what you said before that, but I... Modus, ponens. This is itself the most important act of deduction. And, oh my God, of anything ever. Why? It's basically given two facts, uh, and you uh, can draw a conclusion from the two facts. That's basically all this says. And that's enough for all of the, it turns out this is uh, probably one of the most important parts of deduction ever. So another thing um, noticed by Frege and also others is the usefulness, is the usefulness, usefulness of sets. So in fact, Piano had what we know piano axioms for numbers, um, piano arithmetic. Uh, Frege, I don't remember if it was in this book or later on, he started, he tried to have set service a foundation of all mathematics. 
And a set, to us, naturally, is just a collection. It's just an object which, uh, uh, you know, we understand it intuitively as like a box you put things in. But it's really just an object for the sake of an object. And the fact that there's a contains in relationship between sets is uh, uh, accidental almost. So like to give you an example of how, like why sets are useful, um, there's a, you guys heard of like a, a syllogism? A syllogism is a Greek, uh, like a deduction. You take two facts and you draw one conclusion. So like the classic example is uh, all men are mole. All are. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Socrates is mortal. So we're given two, two statements, and we draw a conclusion. So all men are mortal. Fine. Assumed. Socrates, uh, Socrates is a man. OK, fine. Fact. Axiom. Um, so Socrates is mortal. That's the conclusion we draw. That is quite literally like uh, a kind of modus ponens, if you think about it. We're given some facts. We can draw a conclusion. You could express, this is like, so you know, we know, are very comfortable with symbolic manipulation. But to the ancients, this was not, this was the way you had to do, you had to think about things. But it turns out in, you can still express and encode uh, a complex argument into a formal symbolic manipulation. So what would this look like as a, as a sentence? Um, so all men are mortal. How would I express that in, as like kind of a set? So for all x, uh, if x is in man, uh, then x is in mortal. Right? So... For all x, if x is man, and x, then x is mortal, right? Uh, and uh, if we have Socrates is a man, from here we can simply deduce uh, what? By modus ponens, we get that Socrates is uh, mortal. So the the emphasis and the point of using a formal language and symbolic manipulation for thought is the fact that you cannot make mistakes hopefully any conclusion you draw has to follow the rules the well defined rules of the formal language so you don't get to do illogical jumps in conclusion like even when you make a formal argument in any other case law or something some other natural situation where an argument may occur um, it's what are the, what, are, what are those called? Like those when you when you, you know like a emotional appeal or you know whatever like debate bro level stuff, right? Certainly, if you could formalize any argument through a formal language and symbolic manipulation, it, you you cannot doubt the correctness of the conclusion you draw. That's sort of the idea. Now, can that encapsulate all formal thought? Is a very different uh, thing because implicitly, when you define the rules you interject your own opinions into things. Like, you know, you, you, you guys know what utilitarianism is? All right, if you, if you can do something and you have a moral obligation, if you can do something in a way that doesn't hurt you in any way, financially or anything, you have a moral obligation to do it. That's what utilitarianism is. That sounds right. You could probably put that as an axiom somewhere, that you're, you had a moral obligation to help the person drowning because that's you know what it means, you know, something like that. Um, so when you define... It, it, it's not as objective as it sounds, but in fact, the things you derive are going to be relative to the rules that you create. And the rules that you create are, of course, they come from you as, you know, as, a, as a person. Um, one more thing I want to mention here is that sets are, uh, before they were just boxes, they were really thought of as like types. So when we write like X and S, today we, we think of this like X is in uh, S, right? So like there's an S here, and then X is in it, or something like that, right? But, in, but this symbol E comes from the Greek uh, iota. Probably have to write it Greek, right? Which doesn't mean is. It doesn't mean, excuse me, it doesn't mean in. But it means actually is. So when we write X in S, what we actually don't mean is that X is in S. We actually mean that X is S. So what this is, when you say X and S, you're not actually saying X and S. You're, what you're saying is X is S. 
This is not a containment declaration, but is rather actually a type declaration, okay? Like a programming language. Uh, here, then S would be declared to be a, the set of all something of some type. So S is like the set of all, I don't know, triangles, right? Uh, so by saying X is S, you're saying X has type triangle. That's a declaration of type, rather than a containment of a set. So this was um, Fredge's uh, idea. I'm not going to bother trying to pronounce what that is. So all of this was motivating uh, to one thing, and that was to build a foundation for all of mathematics. Uh, so we want to avoid any inconsistencies uh, possible. An inconsistency, of course, is a proof that 0 equals 1 or something. We want 0 equals 1 to not be provable. And all of this, all of this work was um, in in towards the goals of something called Hilbert's program. So, Hilbert's program uh, basically had these, these like four main goals, right? So we want to build a foundation of mathematics and we are working towards doing so uh, with the following, um, so like, so all mathematics, Uh, in a precise, all mathematics can be written in a precise formal language. Uh, well defined rules. Previously, Hilbert had taken a very close look at Euclid's elements and had, you know, he, he emphasized when he went through the proofs one by one, he would emphasize which proofs used which, theorem, which axioms. When you do a proof naturally, like you're supposed to, like for class or whatever, it's not obvious what axioms you're using. Like, I haven't even told you what the axioms of the numbers are. You just kind of knew that they're there, and you just follow your own intuition. Um, so when you do a proof, it's not, it's not obvious what axioms you're dependent upon. Um, so he wanted to, some of the proofs relied on, some of the proofs in Euclidean geometry relied on the parallel postulate, but only in an implicit way. So it wasn't sure which axioms could be, which of the theorems could ascend from the previous axioms or relied on the parallel postulate. So which one, which model did those theorems work in? So by doing it this way, by, you, can, you can be certain which um, theorems you prove rely on which axioms. And that, that you're able to determine that. Two, uh, it's called completeness. Basically, it says all that is true is provable if a statement is true, it is provable, provably true. And similarly, if a statement is false, there exists a proof that the statement is false. So if you take any good axiomatic system, suppose you have an axiomatic system for set theory, and you remove one axiom, certainly you have a weaker axiomatic system, and perhaps it can only prove the same things if that one axiom was unnecessary. So we want, but you don't want a system, when you list out the axioms of foundations of mathematics, you don't want to forget some axiom. You don't want to, you want to make sure that it's in some sense like a basis spans a vector space. You want to make sure there's no missing statement. You, know? you want to make sure that everything is necessary in there. Right? You don't want to be able to only prove from the axioms a subset of the mathematically true statements. You want to prove all of the mathematically true statements. So that's why it's important that they were working towards having a system, an axiomatic system, uh, be complete. Three is called uh, consistency. So basically, uh, loosely it says 0 equals 1 is not provable. Right? You cannot prove... Uh, something false. Because if you can assume a falsehood, then everything is true, right? If something's true and false simultaneously, every statement now is also true and false, right? Um, another way to word this is like, for all statements, P, uh, P and not P is always false. Nothing can be true and false simultaneously, right? And I guess uh, implicitly is this, uh, P or not, uh, not P is always true. You know what this uh, is called? A 
again, a fancy, crazy spell casting name. Is Star of the Modus? Not that crazy and cool. It's called excluded middle. This is the law of excluded middle. And I want to say these are not all agreed upon by everyone at the time. This is just the Hilbert School. There was five competing schools of thought. Uh, don't care about them right now. But the law of excluded middle basically says everything is true or false. There's no secret third thing, OK? True and false, obviously, to us, computer scientists, Booleans, every, come on. But how do we know if you're working, if you've never seen a computer before, how do you know there's only zero and one? What if there's a two or something? I don't know what these guys were thinking. Everything's either true or false, right? Oh, come on. No. Um, and four is on decidability. So I promise this is a computer science class. Like, um, um, how did I word this? I have to be careful. There should, or there ought to exist, uh, an algorithm uh, to decide the truth value Okay. So basically, decidability, given a statement, there exists an algorithm which you can determine uh, if a statement is true or false. Like, given a statement, an arbitrary statement, there is a way for you to determine if the statement is true or if the statement is false. Um, and that's another motivation for this, this uh, sort of mechanization of all of mathematics. If you can convert al algorithms to what is basically a substring replacement of these well-defined rules, then perhaps... Every theorem that has been you've had difficulty proving is now provable only through mechanical means of these rules. You know, in some sense, this is like really prior, but kind of in the spirit of like Chomsky's Chomsky stuff, right? Where all of mathematics is string manipulation, kind of according to the rules of a grammar, right? Like I already use this example, but if like uh, if for all x f of x is true, uh, then that certainly implies f of three is true, right? If all x, f of x, then certainly f of 3, right? This is called specialization. Um, it should be true because if it's, it's true for all x, it's true for x equals 3, right? So in some sense, this is really a symbolic manipulation of, of x as some sort of non-terminal going, going to strings which represent the values of, this, of the selection there. So here, truth is preserved under a symbolic manipulation. You know? How many times does you know, the distributive property really just feel like you're just moving symbols around on a paper in a way that follow the rules. It doesn't really feel like you're, you're messing with the quantity as so much you are messing with the symbols, right? So they hoped that by studying the symbolic manipulation of the program, you could prove things uh, easier, you know? And there's still, at this time, there's still many unsolved problems. Uh, for, mass, uh, for Matt's last theorem, you know, uh, is, is a problem. All these problems, they were hoping that if there existed such an algorithm, then we could just we don't have to do any more work. We, we're, we've optimized ourselves out of the job. We can now just just apply this algorithm. Maybe it'll take a million years or whatever, but we know a way to find out if the statement is true or false. This uh, will have to come to much later, but the rest of the, is, is part of the discussion for today. So I talked. I said this this um, lecture was not not fluff, but it's going to be a little extra. So there's two things I want to do to show you the value of a symbolic kind of uh, uh, rules of, of formal language in this way. And the first is going to be, um, I'm going to construct the natural numbers given the integers. Excuse me, I'm going to construct the natural numbers given uh, sets. So given numbers, let's suppose you have a set of axioms for numbers. It's not obvious how you could define sets. But, given an, but it turns out that given, a set, given axioms for set theory, you can actually define um, numbers. So in some sense, sets are superior to numbers, right? And that could, might be obvious because numbers are always comparable, right? Like um, for any two numbers, it's either true or false that m is greater than n, right? But it's not necessarily true. It's always true or always false. But two sets are not necessarily, one is either always a subset or the other. 
Actually, if I worded it that way, it's true. Uh, uh, if I worded it this way, though, right? One number is always greater than the other, but it's not necessarily true that one set is always a subset of the other, right? They could be disjoint in an orthogonal way. It's not necessarily that they can each contain each other. The structure goes sideways. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you a construction of the naturals given sets. So first, we have one of the first axioms. And of course, I have to mention sort of a disclaimer. Some of the things I'm going to say today are wrong if you get formal enough. Uh, but I don't want to get too formal because that's a waste of time. I'm trying to be kind of fast. So I'm, I'm going to be talking about axioms as if they're from Frege's system, but they're actually from a more modern system. Um, so we have this axiom called, well, first I'll give you this axiom. See if I can have it. So for all x, for all y, for all z, um, z, z in x, if and only if, uh, z in y implies x equal y. That is called. Um, it's got a fancy, cool name. The axiom of existenti existentiality. Axiom of existentiality. What do you think this axiom does? What, is this, what does this axiom do? It's a warm-up. It basically... Uh, I guess you're saying if two sets have all the elements... They're the same, then the sets are equal? Yes. Yeah, that's it. I mean, that's it. This, set, this, this defines the equality relation. Right? So you would hopefully have set equality as an axiom and not as a theorem. You would Hopefully that's such a primitive idea that you would want to be able to keep that. Two sets are equal if and only if they contain the same elements. If z, for all z, z is an x, if and only if z is an y. So they have to share the same elements. Exactly and only, because if and only if, and it's for all here, they have to share exactly and only the same elements. Then we can say that they're equal. Right? That's what this axiom of extensionality is. Um, this one is called, um, uh, for any a predicate, and I'm being vague here, uh, phi definable within arithmetic. Uh, we have this axiom of uh, there exists y such that for all x, such that um, x is in y uh, if and only if. If and only if uh, phi of x. So this is called uh, the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. Basically, it says anything you can define within arithmetic, there exists a set for it. So, like phi is any function definable within arithmetic symbols, which are then defined on set relations. And if you can define such a function, then you can say that there exists a set of those objects. So for example, as a predicate, let's say I did a predicate for the primes. So prime x. And again, this is for numbers, even though this is a theory of sets. We're gonna, I'm going to just do this as an example so that we can then build the sets from the numbers. Even though we don't know that numbers exist yet, we only know that sets exist. So how would I write this? Um, for all x... There does not exist z, such that z is going to be a divisor of x. So z is going to be, z is going to be, um, we'll say x is not prime, excuse me, x is not 1. Uh, z must be less than or equal to x. Um, z is not 1. Uh, z is not x. And z does not define x. Excuse me, z does not divide x. So of course, all those operations would have to be defined from 
uh, arithmetic symbols, which would be defined from sets, which we're going to do in a second. But this is certainly a predicate we've given. So by, we can apply the axiom of unrestricted comprehension to conclude one thing. There exists a set of primes. We haven't even concluded the set is infinite or anything. You'd have to apply what's called the axiom of infinity. But certainly, you could talk about a set of prime numbers, and then you could reason only about that. It's ridiculous that we have to work kind of like lawyers or something for this, but this is the way the mechanics are done here. This is certainly, I hope there's not a typo here, because there might actually be. Um, I think this is the correct predicate for the numbers that satisfy this predicate are exactly those which are prime numbers. Right? What is the last one? Z divides x. There does not exist z which divides x. So that's the trick. There does not exist z, z divides x. Oh, divides, oh, OK. Yeah, it divides x. So it's a factor of, there's z, it's prime if it doesn't have a factor less than it, right? OK, so um, this is the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. We want to first, we don't even know that the empty set exists. So first, we need to construct the empty set. Certainly, intuitively, if we have sets, there should be some base case, some empty set. So what we're going to do is choose a predicate which no set can satisfy. And then certainly, a set with no elements has to be empty. So given the set of unrestricted comprehend, we comprehend nothing to produce the empty set. You can sometimes define the empty set axiomatically. But why define it axiomatically when you can just you can get it for free. Certainly, if this axiom of unrestricted comprehension says something exists, certainly if something exists, you can deduce that nothing must exist, as the absence of something is then the nothing. So how do we define this? Let x be something unsatisfiable. Let, let this predicate be something unsatisfiable. And I have it as, um, like, it doesn't really matter, but x and x, if and only if, uh, not x and x. So something cannot be true and false simultaneously. Um, by the axiom of, we would probably take it as an axiom of um, what I call it, excluded middle. Nothing satisfies this, right? So by unrestricted comprehension, no x satisfies this. So, so, so by unrestricted comprehension, uh, we get that the empty set exists. Right? We can use that special symbol for that. There's a set with no elements. Um, being a little, a little shorthand here. Now I'm going to define um, two things. I'm going to say let 0 uh, represent the empty set. Let the function or the predicate s uh, w equal uh, the element, the set u union with the set containing the set w. Is that legible? Yeah. So that's what that function is defined. Then I'm going to define the number n plus 1 to be, we'll define that as, to be uh, the successor of n. So first off, we, were, we constructed, here, here we're constructing the numbers from the sets. So 0 corresponds to the empty set. We're just calling it, when we talk about 0 as a number, we're really talking about the set 0. Um, then when we talk about 1, we're going to be talking about what? 1 defined is going to be 0 plus 1 is going to be the successor of the empty set, right? Which is going to be what? It's going to be the empty set union, the set containing the empty set. Right? Which is what? Just the set containing the empty set? So how would we define 2? Two? 2 is going to be um, the successor of 1, which is going to be the successor of the set containing the empty set, which is going to be the set containing the empty set union, the set containing the set containing the empty set. Right? So what is that going to be? That's going to be the set containing the set containing the empty set, excuse me, the set containing the empty set, and the set containing um, the empty set. Now, ridiculous, too many symbols. I saw this as a graffiti in Atlanta. This is, uh, someone wrote that on, on, on a light lamp post. Um, as I repeat this, I would need some more examples, but I kind of don't want to write it. The marker squeaky. This is zero, if you think about it. This is a one. So we have the fact, like, if n, m are numbers, and like n, 
M are the sets that correspond to them. We don't actually have numbers. We only have sets. We're only a theory of sets. We're just kind of having this numbers, exi the existence of numbers as kind of a corollary uh, from the construction of the, we're from constructing the numbers kind of an accident from the set. Um, it's true that M is less than M uh, if and only if like um, N is an element of N. M is an element or a set or a subset. Here it's a, an element, but if I do a bigger example, um, yes, I think it's an element. So here you can define a, a relation among numbers to be such that it is a set, a relation among sets. I want to say this also isn't the way that Frege defined uh, the numbers. This is actually done by von Neumann. Maybe you've heard that name. This is called the von Neumann ordinals. Von Neumann did this when he was like 19. And in fact, Frege came up, his definition of a number was the number n represented the set of all sets containing n elements. So if a number contained, if a set contained elements, n elements, it was having the property of having n, and it therefore belonged to a set of all the other sets containing l n elements, and that was what was defined to be the number n. That was the way he defined a number. But this is just an example of how you can construct, given the sets, you can construct the numbers. So now uh, I've done one construction. I'm going to do uh, one proof. Um, let's do something easy as a proof. So for, for a proof, we're going to do uh, that 1 equals 1. Right? It's kind of easy. Um, by 1, we actually mean the set representing the definition of what we've defined to be the number 1. So we're actually going to be proving uh, that the empty set, the set containing the empty set, is equal to the set containing the empty set. And by equals, we actually mean under the definition of the axiom of existentiality here, where two sets are the same if they contain the same elements. So we want to prove the two sets are the same if they contain the same elements. We want to prove these two numbers are the same. So certainly, uh, let z, uh, this, is, this is x and this is y. So let, we want to prove that z is an x. We want to show uh, like uh, z is an x if and only if uh, z is a y. Right. By the axiom of uh, existentiality, this is sufficient for us to conclude that 1 equals 1, by proving it for these two specific sets. Um, I'm being verbose here on purpose. So uh, let uh, z be an x is equal to the empty set. So z can only then be the empty set. But notice uh, z is in uh, the set containing the empty set, which is equal to y. Okay, what about the other way? Let uh, uh, z be in uh, y, which is equal to the empty set containing the empty set. Um, so z can only really be the empty set then, right? It's a terrible marker. Uh, but if z is the empty set, then z is an element of the set containing the empty set, which is equal to x. So we've proven here then that 1 equals 1. QED. Okay. It's kind of long and verbose, and obviously you... This is what I was talking about earlier, where you, when, you're, when you're doing a human proof for humans to judge and humans to read, you're not doing this at all. You just see 1 equals 1. You don't even bother. You, could have probably, you probably assumed that was an axiom, OK? No one would ever actually think of to try and prove it. That's what the proof might look like. Um, I'm skipping certain steps, probably. I didn't list out what, when, it, when an axiom is. is uh, like, how do you know, for example, if z is the empty set, that z is, an, is contained in the set containing the empty set, besides just pattern recognition of the symbols? There's, have, there's an axiom you have to apply in order to, to get that statement. Okay, so we've constructed the naturals from the uh, sets, and we've proven that 1 equals 1. Now let's get to the whole point of today's lecture, which is on uh, what's called Russell's paradox. So I'm actually going to keep this the axiom of unrestricted comprehension up here because I need it. So
So Fredge uh, publishes his, this work in his late 50s. Uh, Russell is a relatively young guy. He's like uh, mid-20s, late 20s. Got out of prison. Um, he conscious objector to World War I, I think. I might be misremembering the timeline here. But um, basically, he notices the following. Like, um, consider... Uh, the set of all sets which uh, do not uh, contain themselves. Seems kind of a ludicrous thing to say out loud in a semantic uh, understanding. What does it mean for a set to not contain itself? What does it mean for a, what is the set of all sets which don't contain themselves? Certainly a set can contain itself. From in our object understanding of what a set looks like as a box, can't put the box in the box, right? But turns out under the formal rules that Frege defined, you certainly could allow that. You just allow your predicate to be uh, x not an x, okay? There's nothing wrong with writing those symbols. That's legal, that's allowed apparently, okay? That's a relation among sets. Actually, this is supposed to be the negation of x and x, right? Obviously. That's a set. The, a relation is defined among sets, right? Like equality, less than, greater than. There's a, there's a set. There's a set. Fine. Just make them the same set. Then take the negation of the statement. You've defined a predicate in the system of Frege. That is allowed. Okay? By the axiom of uh, unrestricted comprehension, we get what? We get for all y... There exists x uh, such that x is in y if and only if, and here's where we would apply the, func the predicate, if and only if x is not an element of x. This is true by the axiom of, uh, of unrestricted comprehension. We've simply done a, simply done a substring rep replacement of the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. We replace our predicate phi here with what the definition of the predicate is as we defined it. Okay. So um, if it's true for all x, it's true for some x. There's an axiom there you would probably have to cite, probably call something like specialization. But if something is true for all x, it's certainly true for, all, uh, for some x, right? So choose, you're allowed to choose uh, x is equal to y. So what happens when, at the moment that the set x that is true for all x, consider this special case that x is equal to y. What we're going to do here is simply take this statement and replace the x here, replace this for all x with there exists a y. But there already exists a y here, so we're just going to drop the quantifier and replace x with y throughout the statement. What do we get when x equals y? We get the fact that y is contained in, is contained in y if and only if uh, y is not contained in y. So obviously, a statement cannot be both true and false simultaneously. A statement being true, uh, this statement is true if and only if the statement is false. Um, kind of seems a little bit like black magic, but, but according to the way it was proved, it was proved well within the formal rules of Frege's system. So what this means is that Russell found an inconsistency in Frege's system. And not just Frege's system, but many systems like, like his. So this is an inconsistency. It's basically zero equals one, right? False is, uh, is uh, false is true. So uh, this was a this was a big deal at the time because Frege had worked for dozens of years, who knows how long of his life's work, building these systems, building these rule, formal rules. Frege, maybe one of the founders of analytic philosophy, spent all this time thinking about like what does it mean for an object to be green, and then you settle on the, all the things we take for granted now, all the symbolic manipulation that we do, all, the idea of sets and containment and all this. And uh, right before it's about to be published, um, a second edition or something, uh, Russell comes out with this issue. You know. A system, so basically, the system was not consistent. It seemed useful to prove certain parts of mathematics, but it wasn't um, uh, useful. And it, it was wrong. Like, if you have a set of rules that can prove 0 equals 1, it's not a good system. So let's see what I can do here. Which one is the left projector? I'm going to gamble it's the right one.
So have you guys heard of Papa Dimitriou? You guys know who Christos Papa Dimitriou is? Is he with the algorithms book? Yes. Das Gupta, Papa Dimitri of Vazmarani, he's the P in the DPV book. He's also, like, so many times I've accidentally read a book, and then it's like his name is on the cover. So this is actually, I hope I didn't, I don't think I need to turn all the lights off. This is, a, this is not a textbook. This is a graphic novel by Papa Dimitri and others. And it says, uh, number one New York Times bestseller. Uh, I think every book is a New York Times bestseller. I don't think that means anything. But this is actually, can I figure out the zoom on this Good. thing? This is actually a graphic novel of the life of Bertrand Russell. So I have some sections I want to pull out of here to show you sort of the history of what happened. So it's, an, it's, it's, it's relatively boring about, um, let me see if I can find. So here's, so here's Bertrand Russell as a young guy. He's learning about geometry. He's doing some proofs of statements, something about equal isosceles triangles. It doesn't particularly matter. But what's important here, of course, is the fact that he was doing all these proofs and, then, and you know, he was able to derive a truth that seemed independent of any observation or anything. It, was, it, was, it seemed objective to him. Um, then in the book, he meets Cantor. He meets uh, Frege. I don't think I can find it. There's Papa Dimitri. It was kind of a meta book. So sometimes there's, that's what Papa Dimitri looks like in the illustrator. He looks like that in real life. Um, do I have it? Let's see if I can find it. Okay, so this is the this is the syntax used used in Frege's system. It's kind of blurry. Maybe I could do. Yeah, so this is the syntax used in Frege's system, which we don't really use today, but that's kind of what it looked like, where you have some implications in universal and existential quantification. This part we didn't preserve. We preserved some of his other notation historically, but this one is, you know, it was the first guy to do it. He, he failed on that part, but um, this is what Frege looks like. He's, in the book, he's kind of like an angry old man. He's like, he's like, you know, get out of my face. And then he goes and he talks to Cantor. We talked about George Cantor's diagonalization proof. I might be... doesn't really matter. Um, but I want to come to the part where he discovers Russell's paradox. So Russell's paradox, and it, I've this part sticky noted. He's just talking about it in the past. So I'll read to you uh, this part of the of the book. Sets. I thought you were interested in numbers. In my research, I made uh, much use of the simple idea of the priest of Bolzano. So this guy, the priest of Bolzano, was the one who came up with sets as a mathematical object. It, something has to be invented by people. I am, but sets are the basis of numbers. What is three but a set of all, uh, but the set of all sets with three elements? Threeness is the common property of three umbrellas, three horses, three three hats, three cookies. Sets have most interesting properties, really, and I thought them boring. For example, a set can contain other sets, even itself. How can it contain itself? The set of all ideas is an idea. Therefore, it contains itself as an element. But not all sets contain themselves. No, the set of all birds is not a bird. I say that. It's an interesting dichotomy. The set of all sets which contain themselves and the set of sets which don't. About which we can ask, well, does it contain... Dun, dun, dun. He's got his little eureka moment. And then here's back into the... It's still the past, but he's an old man now. In my life state... In my life today, I've written dozens of books, hundreds of articles. I've given thousands of lectures. But I suspect... My name will survive, if it does at all, for a confounded paradox I discovered that year. A paradox that brought logic upside down. I'll give you a taste of it. Imagine a town with a strict law on shaving. I like how he's describing this like the, like the Cuphead art style, which is much newer than... This is like 1905, and this Cuphead is like 1960s, right? Imagine a town with a strict law on shaving. By it, every adult male is required to shave daily. But it's not obligatory to shave yourself. For those who don't want to, there is a barber. In fact, the law decrees those who don't shave themselves are shaved by the barber. Those who don't shave themselves are shaved by the barber. It sounds innocuous. However, if taken literally, it leads straight to paradox. For you see, the question arises, who will shave the barber? He obviously cannot choose to shave himself. For being the barber, it would be that that he should be the man who shaves only those who don't shave themselves. But he can't go to the barber, for again, that will mean he'll shave himself, for which the barber isn't for. Do you see the problem? I'm not sure. And so this is the, the book is kind of meta. So these are the people writing the book, writing themselves into the book. It's very much like the paradox of the liar. And which liar? I think she has a Greek accent. Um, 
the famous pronouncement of Edubolides, Edubolides, the man who said, my fellow citizens, I am now lying to you. Think of it. If he is lying, then he is in fact telling the truth. And if he is telling the truth, he is lying. When something refers to itself, paradox is nearby. Take self-referential books, for example. Reference books. No, no, the books that include references to themselves, like Stern's Tristram Shanty, Calvino's If on a Winter's Night, A Traveler, or Kurt Vonnegut's Breakfast of Champions. Haven't read any of those. Of course, Logic Comics is, of course, self-referential. So this footnote is, the book is called Logic Comics. They're referencing the book. Suppose you make a complete catalog of all books that are not self-referential. It will be a, a big catalog, this. Sure, but the question is, will it contain itself? And so she's thinking, and the gears are turning, and she says, got it. If it does, then it doesn't. And if it does not, it does. The student gets an A+. Plus. So what has this got to do with Russell's paradox? Like these examples, it has self-reference at its core. Does the set of all sets contain itself? To which the answer is, if it does, then it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then it does. Voila, Russell's paradox. It sounds like parlor witticism, but it subverts the notion of set as a collection defined by a common property, and with it, logic. So that's what we, the book doesn't say it, but that's the axiom of unrestricted comprehension. The publication of my paradox was made me an overnight celebrity in international mathematical circles. Some greeted it with joy, like Poincaré, who saw in a paradox strongly arguments against any attempt to create a purely logical foundation for mathematics. His oft-repeated credo that logic is barren now found a perfect justification. Actually, it's not barren. It breeds contradictions. Ha ha. This Russell hit two birds with one stone. Logic and set theory are both destroyed. Rather surprisingly, Cantor's reaction was quite positive. Therefore, if we take the property belonging to S belonging to S and consider its negation defining the set something, 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 of which the set does not glory be to almighty God. So he's actually a generation older than Russell and Frege. He's old in this book, and he's like a crazy religious. He, he like did some research on the who, Jesus' parents or something like this. I don't exactly know. In, in the book, it's, of course, kind of fiction, fictionalized, but I'm a free man at last. Don't you understand? The Englishman has proved the set of all sets is an impossibility. My monster, the usurper of the absolute of God's greatness, therefore, thus no longer exists. Given the right amount of irrationality, one can even read religion, read religion even in logic. It was, uh, but in the pro-set camp, the bewilderment among the cons and consternation of logicians were devastated. Giuseppe Piano in Turin, non impossible. So he's there, he's like a little chicken. He's confused. David Hilbert in Gottingen, he said, there must be a, some way around this, her professor. Ja, ja, there must be. Damn, I'm start Brit. And of course... God loved Frege in Jenna. He read my paradox on the very day he was to give the go-ahead to print volume two of his Foundations of Arithmetic. I think that's a different book than Berg Grisha's Shift. And in essence, he read, he realized the important of my, importance of my discovery. Frege, too, had built his edifice on the grounds of Bolzano's simple idea of set. And now he had seen that this ground was rotten. It had given away. By implanting sets into logic, he had injected a lethal canker into its body. So the foundations of arithmetic were unfounded. Don't be late for dinner, Gottlob. So he's off, and he says, What? Destroy the printing plates immediately. Don't you see it's wrong? It's a disgrace. It's, it's grotesque sham. Her professor, we slaved on this for years on end. If you don't take pity on your own work, then at least consider mine. I implore you, sir, don't do it. In the end, he did publish volume two of the foundations of arithmetic, but with an addendum. Of all the acts of intellectual honesty I have witnessed in my life, none compare with Golub Frege's reaction to my paradox. There cannot be a greater intellectual courage than this, to put the truth above all else. Hardly anything more unfortunate can befall a scientific writer than to have the foundations of his edifice shaken after the work is finished. I was placed in this position by a letter by Mr. Bertrand Russell, just when the printing of this volume was near its completion, the collapse of one of my... The collapse of one of my laws, to which Mr. Russell's paradox leads, seems to undermine not only the foundations of my arithmetic, but the only possible foundations of arithmetic as such. So that's that section of Logic Comics. We'll come back to this book. Um, we're not done with it. We'll come back to it on Thursday. I have one more kind of, kind of section I want to read from it. But there's, uh, before we finish, there's two, two important details I forgot to mention about this proof. The, the book, the Logic Comics, is meant to be accessible. It doesn't actually cover... Uh, 
Russell's paradox to the level we've done it. But I want to make some remarks about the proof now that we know uh, what some of the history is. So here, we were able to use the axiom of unrestricted comprehension to deduce the fact that um, uh, if you're allowed to define a set which contains, uh, you're allowed to define this predicate, there exists a set which does not contain itself, then you can lead to the contradiction through Russell's paradox. Um, two things. This is probably the most important question in the course, in, the whole, in this little series. What is the name of this proof technique? What is the name of Russell's proof technique here? It's not obvious, obviously. It's, it's definitely not obvious what the, what the answer is to this question, but it's, a, it's an important answer. You want to see? Do a little audience poll. Con contradiction, kind of? Close. The, uh, the answer I'm looking for, though, is what we covered last time. This is a proof by diagonalization. So we use diagonalization to prove that there are uncountably many, there's an uncountable set. The reals, the infinitely long binary strings, this is the power set, these are uncountable sets. Di this is also proof by diagonalization. Why? There's some sort of fixed point, there's some sort of self-reference, and there's some sort of negation. Here's the fixed point. The set is pointing to itself. The set containing itself is the diagonal. Consider this relation but consider an axis and the axis of all x and all y on one axis and on y and the other. The part where this relation is defined is going to be the diagonal of whatever that table is. This is the self-reference. This is the negation. This, in some sense, is the, there is a diagonal, there is a self-reference, and there is a negation. This is a proof by diagonalization, implicitly. Where is, how did we get the diagonal? We defined the table for all x, but then we chose x equals y. What happens when x equals y in a matrix, if you consider the indices x equals y? Those are exactly the elements on the diagonal. By choosing, for all, when, when we specialized, we went from for all x, we went to there exists an x, when that x, let's suppose it's the one that's y, that is us looking at the diagonal of this table. So this is nothing more than a proof by diagonalization over a different kind of object. Second thing I want to note is that Russell then didn't give up the dream of the formalists, like Hilbert. He really still wanted to find a foundation of mathematics, even though he found an error in Russell's uh, thing. He tried to fix this in two ways, and he spent 20 years on this thing called Principia Mathematica. So he wrote 20 volumes of a book or whatever. He spent so long of his life trying to write this a foundation of mathematic, a foundation of uh, of logic, and he tried to succeed where Russell failed. Excuse me, he tried to succeed where Frege failed. Russell did, and he first off, the problem appears to be self-reference. Like this issue occurs because you allow sets to describe themselves. So he fixes this in two ways. First, he replaced unrestricted comprehension, which was kind of like you know, for any predicate uh, phi, the set exists to contain those elements. He replaced this with uh, something called restricted comprehension which is, it only allows you to define subsets. So roughly, it looks like this. You can define sets only that are subsets of other sets. This appears to avoid immediate contradictions like Russell's paradox. So it seems we're OK by replacing the axiom of unrestricted comprehension with the axiom of restricted comprehension. And the second more important thing he did was, and I think actually this is vaguely more recent than this is from something called ZFC and not from Russell system, but I'm just going to say it's from Russell system. He did this thing called the theory of types. So basically, anything of type i can only speak about things of type i minus 1 or less. So while self-reference, if you think of it like this, right, it's like you're talking about yourself. I mean, the, the, this is really an encoding of uh, the liar's paradox. I am lying. This statement is false. Using the formal language of Frege's system, you get to talk, you have a statement talk about its own truth uh, in, a self, in a system that allows self-reference, he hoped to have a system that didn't have self-reference. So through a series of types, anything in type i could only talk about statements below type i. So in this sense, uh, something like this, right? Hopefully, statements could not talk about anything about their own type, and therefore, um, you could hopefully avoid self-reference. This was the motivating goal. Like, you can do this, you don't, you hopefully avoid Russell's paradox. 
And there's like 20 volumes. It took him 20 years of his life to write it. It's mostly useless. And the graphic novel goes a little bit into his development of, of, of Principia Mathematica. Um, uh, it took him like 170 pages using his system to prove that 1 plus 1 equals 2. We were able to prove 1 equals 1 today. 1 plus 1 equals 2 using a formal symbolic manipulation takes 170 pages or something. It's ridiculous. There's only like five people in the world that, knew, that read all his work. Um, he actually, after writing most of the system, he spent a lot of time trying to prove that it's both consistent and complete. That everything that can be proved can be proved from within Max Principia Mathematica, that it was complete. There was nothing it missed. It was like a spanning basis. And two, that it was consistent. That the state, that the, the Principia Mathematica could not prove zero equals one. How do you prove his axioms cannot prove something? That's kind of difficult to do. And uh, the answer, if he was successful, we'll have to talk about next time. So 